Welcome to Equinox, where Rob and I are striking the balance between the light and the dark. This is episode 72, the Nobel Prize winners episode. My name is Joseph Darnell, and I'm joined by my good friend, the doctor, Robert Carter. Hello, Rob. Joe, this is not the Nobel Prize. This is the second annual Nobel Prize edition. The second annual! Woo! We have a tradition. We made it! And we actually talked about this before we had the first one, that this was going to be a tradition. Yes. We do want to have many, many traditions, but uh, this was a good place to start. And last year, there were some pretty exciting Nobel Prizes. Yeah. Last year and, was great. Uh, we talked about multiple categories. Yes. It was a good year. It was a good yeah. year to introduce them. Yeah. I'm so glad we did it last year and not this year to start introducing them. <laughs> but we'll, we'll go through that. So uh, your general impressions of the Nobel Prizes this year was a uh, disappointment, a downer, yeah. deflating? Yeah. I mean, last year you know, it was crisper, you know, and this year is just like, hey, these people did new math for climate change modeling. It's like, okay. So, you know, um, very important things. People really laid down a lot of good groundwork for future work, but it's not like, you know, I invented nuclear power or something cool like that. Just little things. So as somebody who didn't understand how the Nobel prizes worked, I pictured that it was probably like the, the film culture, how if a movie is made, it's made and it comes out and it's good. But if there is a, a dry spell where there isn't any good writing and there is, what do they call it? Where there's a writer strike and nobody's got any good material to produce this year. There's going to be a lull in the award season where there weren't any good films to promote or to win awards. And so my mind went to, okay, science had a lull because there was a pandemic that hit the whole world. Oh, so no. scientists yeah, no. couldn't get good work done on the field and they didn't have as many important discoveries because they were, studying the virus and that means they just didn't get a lot of exceptional work done for the year but you explained to me that it's not like that it's yeah, not at all this is for mm -hmm. like basically it's a lifetime achievement award in, in a lot of ways this is for stuff people did years or decades ago that's influencing scientific development today in the most profound ways a nobel committee can find so that means that it was just an off year just was they just didn't get anything crazy for, awesome. For, for, for my likings, I thought it was kind of boring. But for the world of science, these are very important things. It's just like, you know, like, you know, um, uh, Russell Crowe's movie, Beautiful Mind. Mm -hmm. you yeah. Know, he, he's trying to play this, this mathematician who's coming up with game theory. Right. And of course, they're getting rid of the child molestation charges in that story. And you just skip over that part. But, you know, it, it's like why would, you know, two guys walk into a bar, who gets the girl? You know, why would that be so important in the world of science? Well, it turns out to be incredibly important mathematical concepts, even though they're really simple. And yet it's the kind of thing that doesn't make you go, wow, man, that, that's really cool. That sparkles. <laughs> for sure. Well, what can the scientists do? They're not trying to tap dance for us. No. So they have several categories, as uh, you know, I learned last year. They go through literature, economics, peace, physics, physiology, or medicine, and chemistry. Yeah. Do you want to take them in that order? I think we should. We'll, we'll save the science ones for last because that will spend more time on those. Okay. Now, uh, audience, we're not bored with this. No. No, this is, this is amazing and cool, but it's just esoteric mm. when we get into it. So it's going to be like, what on earth does this mean? Yes. All right. By the way, the Nobel Prizes, if you weren't here last year when we talked about Alfred Nobel, these have been given since the 1800s. Nobel was an industrialist and a prolific inventor. He invented um, dynamite, which is basically uh, nitroglycerin that's been stabilized so it doesn't blow up on you. Uh, he took all of his or a lot of his money and he threw it into the Nobel process basically you know, he gave away money to start up a foundation to award prizes to amazing scientists and writers and economic theorists over the years so first up we have the nobel for literature the nobel prize in literature for 2021 is awarded to the novelist Abdul, uh, sorry, I'm just going to call him Mr. Gurna, if that's okay. Is Gurna safe to go with, or is that Jurna? 
Mr. Gurnah. G U R N A H. Yes. Abdurazak. Gurnah. I think that's fine. Hey, your, your phone is talking. I'm sorry. Shh. Phone? Quiet. Got an awards going on here. Turn down, turn on. No more volume on the phone. I'll put it far away. So, awarded to Mr. Gurna for his uncompromising and compassionate penetration of the effects of colonialism and the fate of the refugee in the gulf between cultures and continents. Okay. Good stuff. Um, Not I, necessarily I, scientific, but... Well, no, it's, it's literature. Okay. Yeah. He's exploring the condition of people, mainly African people, who suffer greatly at the hands of uh, European powers for decades, for centuries even. Hmm. And the effects are being still felt today. Now, there is a poll on the Nobel Prize website for have you read his works? 6% of the people who have voted have said that they have read. So out of like 7,200 people, not yeah. many have read any of his, his material. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, you know, with the high praise coming from the Nobel Prize, maybe they'll get more attention to the work. That would make sense. Then I want to move on to uh, the next prize. Economics. Uh, it, this is where... It, it, there's also more difficult things to pronounce, but we'll do our best. Da, 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 where's the part that says it's about this award? This year's laureates. Oh, it's David Card, Joshua Angrisk, and Guido Imbens. I, I just, I'm not seeing the part about this award. Yeah, that's the Sferiges Riksbank. <laughs> who... <laughs> okay, you introduce this one. All right. The Sferiges Riksbank is introducing the award for three People, David Card, Joshua Angris, and Guido Imbens, who did natural experiments that helped answer important questions for society. Okay. They asked questions about minimum wages, immigration, labor market. They helped clarify uh, cause and effect uh, as far as, you know, how do these things affect us today? And, and what's the, the person who's doing the work worth? You know, three guys who are... At the bottom of their field or the top of the field, but the bottom of the hierarchy where everyone else is basing their work on their work. And so a lot of these awards this year are multiple people and they're trying to like summarize all the people together into one sentence or so. And it's not easy to do because they're doing dissimilar things. They just happen to get all awarded together. I mean, they demonstrate many of society's big questions can be answered. And they use natural experiments or situations arising in real life that resemble randomized experiments. And now it does say that the first of these economic sciences awards was given to Ragnar Frisch and Jan Tenbergen in 1969. And uh, two of these economic awards have been given to women. They say that there has been 53 economic science prizes altogether. There's 89 science <clears throat> economic sciences laureates there's 46 young laureates okay so how what do you have to do to be young i guess under the age of 45 or something i don't know i guess so yeah, so here's an I... interesting question this is one that they use in the um in the discussion there is an association between education and income people with higher education levels tend to make more money than people with lower education levels is it education that does it hmm. or is the type of person who's attracted to education more likely to get a high-paying job because of the type of person they are. Dun-dun-dun! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's what these guys are discussing and dealing with. And answering those kind of questions is why they got the Nobel Prize. Because honestly, I would like to know, or I would have liked to have known as a young man, should I pursue a PhD? The answer is no. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, if, if plus the extra years that I put into pursuing it, I could have been earning... And advancing in some job. Mm, so, yeah. you know, it depends. I want to be a college professor. That's why I went and got my PhD. I wasn't going for, for glory or gold. But if I had to do it again, I probably would have gone into international finance as a young man, made a million dollars and retired now. And now I'd be going studying marine biology and genetics just for fun, <laughs> being a creation speaker. But yeah, that's a, a tough question to know if you should go to school or not. And the answer is almost always yes. Yeah, well, interesting. Yeah. And then moving on to the Peace Laureates for 2021, the Norwegian Nobel Committee has decided to award the Nobel Prize to Maria Ressa and Dmitry Muratov for their efforts to safeguard freedom of expression, which is preconditioned for democracy and lasting peace. That's very nice of them. Maria Ressa uses freedom of expression to expose abuse of power, 
the use of violence and growing authoritarianism in her native country, the Philippines. And Dmitry Muratov has for decades defended freedom of speech in Russia under increasingly challenging conditions. So in other words, they identify two people in the world who are fighting corruption and political oppression and things like that. Yeah. I have honestly no idea where on the political spectrum these people fall, but I would be in favor of supporting the free speech rights of leftists as much as rightists because it has to go both ways or we all lose. Yeah. I honestly know nothing about these people and maybe I'm ignorant. Maybe the, the ways of the world, I should be more aware of what's happening around me. But um, because they're not you know, physicists and uh, chemists and things like that, I, I don't know. Interestingly, di- they did take another poll at the bottom of the page. It says, what do you think? Do you agree that freedom of expression and freedom of the press is important for fraternity between nations? They had 30,000 votes and 18% said yes. 82% said no. 82% said freedom of press is not important? It is not important for fraternity between nations. That's terrifying. Yeah. Oh, that is scary dangerous. Yeah. That means we could be lying to Russia about whatever we want to know. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> we do need the, the Nobel Prizes around to promote whole, more wholesome values. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm really surprised. And Okay, but see that... Those the eighty five percent. Those are the same people that did not read the writings of the Nobel Prize in Literature winner, who was talking about the effects of colonialism, stuff like that, and probably the people who have no idea about the implications of these the economics winners, who are talking about the labor market and things like that, or the Peace Prize person who is talking about oppression. So yeah, I wonder who these people who are taking these poll actually are. Mm, wow, people, we need to get educated here. Indeed. That's what we're all about here on, at uh, Equinox yeah. Education. And introduce physics. Physics. Okay, finally. Okay. Ah, <laughs> the Nobel Prize in Physics for 2021 was split between three people. Two people got one half, which means they each got a quarter, and one person got a half. They awarded to Siyukuro Manabi and Klaus Hasselmann, and the other half went to Giorgio Parisi. These people laid the foundations, mathematical and theoretical, for studying the climate, how humanity influences it. They revolutionized the theory of disordered materials and random processes. So going back several decades ago, people were talking about chaos theory. People were talking about, you know, can a butterfly's wing start, you know, a flap of a butterfly wing in Toronto start a thunderstorm over Toledo? And all those sorts of questions, that's not quite what they were doing, but it was, it's in a similar vein. How much randomness can you have in a system before the system can be explained? And one of the examples they gave was, imagine there's a box of balls. And there's, the balls don't fill up the whole floor of the box, but the, the walls of the box can, can be pushed in. Well, every time you push it in and crunch the balls together and open it up and crunch them together again, they're going to form a different pattern. But... One of these people said, ah, but there's a predictive pattern here. Even though the pattern is different every time, there are certain things about this pattern that are predictable. And because of that, we're able to look at the weather, which on the short term is chaotic, but on the long term is called climate. And we can go from the chaos of, of short term weather to long term predictions of climate. You know, how much do we know? How much do we need to know? How much error can we have in our data set before we can't make further predictions beyond certain window? Those are really critical ideas. And once you have them laid down, we have climate modeling. Now, a lot of our audience is like, but climate change isn't real, blah, 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 blah. And so this, this gets under the conservatives' feathers. Is that, the, is that a, I don't know, I always get my metaphors mixed up. This, um, this riles up the, 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 the feather, rouse the feathers, rouse the fluff. I don't know what. It makes conservatives mad when it you gets, talk about it climate gets, change. It gets their goat. Their gets goat, their goat. Okay, the, the thank goat you. Feathers. I, I like that. Okay, yeah. that's a good one. Thanks for helping me with my metaphor. Um, but as a scientist, and we've talked about climate change before, and we've talked about Don Batten's article on climate change on creation.com, which I helped edit, and I fought with him over certain issues, and he beat me usually. Um and not beat me physically. I mean, he, he won the argument usually. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are aspects of climate change that need to be discussed and are very important for the modern world. And yes, humans have enough bulldozers where we can flatten all the forests of the world if we so chose. 
and we can burn up all the coal and we can kill all the krill and eat the fish and we can definitely affect worldwide climate. But the sun is more variable than we realized. And so all the climate modeling is couched upon how much energy we're getting from the sun. And that's an open question. We don't know enough yet. But it's not zero. We do know a lot. And all the climate models, literally all of them, are pointing toward warming in the future. And it's not based on ignorance. They, they ground yeah. truth these things. And does this match the last 30 years of data? Yeah, it does. Okay, now let's go forward 30 years. Oh, you can't do that. But no. The mathematics laid down by these guys, who now won the Nobel Prize for it, helps us estimate into the future and put an error bar on the estimate. And that's the critical part. How wrong can we be is critical. Hmm. And we now know that because we can mathematically model it. Hmm. Fascinating. Yeah. Good work. Way to go, guys. And then the Nobel Prize to uh, Physiology or Medicine was jointly given to David Julius and Artem Pat... Pa, pata, pata, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Patapotuan. <laughs> Patapushian. Patapushian. I'm going to say P-A-T-A-P-O-U-T-I-A-N. That's how I pronounce it in, in American English anyway, so... For the discoveries of receptors for temperature and touch. Okay. In other words, how, when you touch something, how Pain do you feel it? Detection. What is the thing in the skin that lets you feel hot, cold, or pressure? And think how important this is for robotics. I mean, a robot hand reaches down and picks up a delicate vase. How come it doesn't crush it? Well, same thing with the human hand. We have this, these proprioceptors and temperature sensors. They figured out what the proteins were and how they worked. And, you know, when you, when you grab something, it opens up an ion channel and ions flow through into the nerve. And nerve says, oh, I am undergoing pressure or, oh, this is hot. And they're different receptors with different reactions. And now we know what genes are controlling these things. We know how many there are. We know, um, you know, how much pressure is the minimum pressure we can detect and, and the maximum for just, oh, this is a lot of pressure, but you can't tell if it increases after that. And this is laid down by these guys. Um, again, decades ago, decades ago. Really cool stuff and really important stuff. And it completely changes our fundamental understandings of who we are as people and how we react and interact with the outside environment. Okay. That's good enough for me. Okay. Way to go, guys. You're awesome. Even if we can't quite pronounce your name. <laughs> so next is chemistry. Am I right? Yes. Okay. 2021 Nobel Prize in Chemistry to Benjamin List and David McMillan for an ingenious tool for building molecules. What? Building molecules? Building molecules. Um, it took me a while to figure out what this was about. These guys were working independently um, as younger men. Oh, there's only one woman in this whole list. Hmm. One, of the, uh, one of the authors. Well, that's surprising. That's very surprising. Hey, ladies. Well, of course, this is from a lot of these awards are from decades ago work. I mean, Jennifer Doudna got her you know, Nobel Prize last year for, for CRISPR. That was only a couple of years old. So because males dominated science for so long, and it's only recently that females are starting to get parity as far as numbers go in scientific fields, it's going to take them a little longer to build up the repertoire for the Nobel Prizes to start kicking in. Okay. Mm. I think that's my answer. I don't think it's sexist. Oh, no, not at all. But what these guys did decades ago, working independently, is they figured out instead of going to extremely complicated organic chemistry to build molecules, they said, one of, one of the guys in particular said, okay, here's this enzyme, this very complicated enzyme. It's made of protein. It's this huge thing. But only one amino acid actually does a chemical reaction. This huge protein is irrelevant. That's the active site. So he said... If I take that amino acid only and add it to my test tube, will it make a chemical reaction? And sure enough, it did. It made the same chemical reaction under the right condition. He says, I don't need the protein. Hmm. I can do X. And so what they did was they built a, um, a recipe book for building other molecules from simple molecules. I think that's how I would describe it. And it, it just is a giant shortcut. And it allowed people to do a lot of organic chemistry and build some really fancy molecules a lot more easily, if I can explain yeah. it that way. Yeah. It's made chemistry a lot cleaner, a lot less toxic materials, and it's uh, really pushed uh, pharmacological or pharmaceutical research as far as discovering new things. Because if you, want, if you have a molecule, right, and you say, okay, I need to add an oxygen to that. 
Yeah. Well, that's not easy to do. Oh, but there's another molecule that adds oxygen to, to molecules like that one. Let's use that instead of trying to, you know, soak it in pH 2 solution for 45 minutes under acid conditions and then adding another chemical and this and that. Now, let's use a, a larger molecule to do that. So it's almost like they're mimicking life because mm. life does that. Living things, they do single molecule precision chemistry yeah test tubes don't do that no test tubes are dirty mass action chemistry and the reaction never goes fully to completion but living things aren't like that and i think that's what they're doing they're they're almost like living things but on a really simplified level wow that's got to be the most impressive one that takes the cake i guess it does but it wasn't like you know i figured out how to change the human genome no or yeah it was, these are fundamental and Pretty esoteric prizes this year. We'll have links to all of these in the show notes if you want to hop right to them. We knew that this was going to be a lighter episode for the Nobel Prizes. So yes, sadly. Rob, you brought together a couple of other interesting stories, and uh, now we get to the fun stuff. Yeah, we said, you know, <laughs> these Nobel Prizes might just be a little dry, so let's add some... Much more cra- I'm trying to think bizarre. Ga- and gazingy. That's not, the, that's not even a word. More uh, variety and pizzazz. Pizzazz, that's a good word. More pizzazz, more zing, yes. more zep to our, our discussion. So, just trolling around the internet, I found top 10 future technologies you've definitely never heard. Now, it sounds like clickbait, doesn't it? (laughs) Sign me up. Yeah, it definitely sounds like clickbait. But some of these are really cool ideas. Okay, I'm game. All right. But in Grant You, they already did highlight that, like, there's a lot of the cool stuff in the popular sciences that you hear about, like CRISPR. But they wanted to bring to attention some of the lesser knowns that are in the up and coming, in the running up. That will get your attention in the next who knows how many years, but could be important, may go nowhere, but are definitely right. interesting and should consider the possibilities of what these can do. The first one in their list was femtosecond projection two photon lithography. Uh, all right. It's basically, you know, 3D printer works where, where they have a thing scanning. Yeah. And they're like the one that in, in that like nose that goes down is like coming back and forth yeah. and back yeah, and yeah, forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Joshua has one that uses light to do the 3D printing. Uh, Joshua is one of the, one of the guys web in our department office. here at the yeah. office. Yeah. And it, there's a solution and there's a thing that goes and it paints the top of the solution with light and the thing goes down. And every time it paints it with light, it polymerizes where the light hits it. But you can only do one spot at a time and it follows the track. Well, these guys figured out how to, you know, do millions of points at the same time. It's sort of like, imagine that you projected an image and bink, and then you took your object and lowered it a little bit and it projected yeah. another image and it's just like that. And it's just kind of smart and it's a whole lot faster, like a thousand times faster and probably a lot more accurate because you don't have to have a thing scanning back and forth. It's not world changing, but it was interesting. That actually sounds like if for 3D printing, that would be a, a leap forward in the technology. Yeah. You want to do the next one? Sure. So this, the, I've heard the, about this one before. This is kind of cool. Yeah. So they introduced another technology called LiFi. And uh, it's, it's L-I-F-I. The, yeah. LiFi. Yes. And we have a podcast called Hi-Fi. This yeah. is LiFi. And it aims to use light to transmit information from point A to point B. Blink your rights really fast. Yeah. It's and like, you can send Morse code over your it's light. It's like Morse code yeah. really super duper fast through the lights. Yeah. So would this mean that if we were sitting in this room right now and this technology was running, that the ceiling lights could actually be sending messages to and from each other from yep. one side of the room to the other side of yep. the room? Or to my computer, yeah. my computer to the light. Now, this would work in well-lit areas where one light could see all the other lights and it could go down the chain. So maybe, okay, I was trying to think of where would be a use case for this. First of all, it has to be dark. Dark well, enough to where the light sources that are man-made can... Depends on the frequency of light you're talking about. Oh. Because it could be using infrared while we're in looking broad, at, in at the visible. Yeah. And then it wouldn't do any flickering to disturb people. True. Well, yeah, but even so, I mean, think of how fast is your Wi-Fi signal? Pretty fast. How, how many hertz? Uh, hertz? <laughs> I know megabits per second. Oh, how many megabits per second? Yeah, 50. Okay. 
Well, that's that's 50 million bits per second. Yeah. That's 50 million hertz, essentially. Close enough. And we can see flickers of less than 30 hertz. Golly. <laughs> I hadn't thought of it that way. <laughs> so, bzz, I mean, you can't see the flickering and you could have a Wi-Fi signal coming through mm. our lights here. And yeah, how? we're not anywhere close to being able to detect it. We would never know. They, they do suggest that this could be done for a variety of use cases. Not, It's not practical for all use cases, but is this one of those features that if you put this on top of all the other features we have for data communication, it opens up more possibilities. It's pretty cool. Yeah, pretty it's pretty cool. crazy. But it also depends upon the light source being able to see the other light sources. Yes. Yes, it does. But light sources can also go through light sources. Dun, dun, because dun. you shine two lasers at right angles, they go right through each other and keep on going. Yeah. Light, light yeah. But, no, like that. but not things like walls and roofs and trees. Well, that's right. But it also makes it more secure. It can't yes. leak out of your house. Yes. Except through the window. But mm. and there's no windows in this room. No one outside this room could pick up our Li-Fi signal if we had one. Hmm. Crazy. The next one is interesting and kind of obvious. Energy storing bricks. This actually was the craziest that I had read from the list. Why really not? Cool. Yeah. Why not take bricks and change their properties so that they store heat very well instead of just kind of like a rock? Yeah, they kind of store heat, but no, make them really heat dense. Warm them up in the daytime and let them warm all night long. Now, one of my friends who's also a listener of this podcast, he um, has talked to me several times about using depleted uranium as a building material. And then you wouldn't need a heater in your house. Because <laughs> the, bricks, the bricks would always be warm. <laughs> and they go down exponentially over time. But for, you know, 10 or 20 years, you have a nice warm basement. <laughs> No. All right. The next one's yours and it's awesome. Ah, okay. This is right up our alley. Uh, uh, Let's turn on Beequinox here, guys. We've got robotic bees. Wait a minute. Maybe that's not so much Beequinox material. Yeah, it is. Anti. Oh, okay. No, no, no. That definitely is. Okay. In the spirit of Beequinox, we've got robotic bees. So we do have the concern that crops have to be pollinated. And it's getting to be tougher and tougher because honeybees are not suitable for the job in every climate. And there's more work to be done than they can even keep up with. And if we're going to continue to manage all of the output, the production of the food supply around the world, we might need some more bees as the bee population around the world continues to dwindle those wild native not bees. really all the dwindling. Different... I know the environmentalists say so, but isn't there? How about this? How about this? Mm-mm-mm-mm. We need plants that can be pollinated on Mars. If we're going to grow crops, some of them need to be pollinated. So we just invent robot bees. Yeah. 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 There so you go. The, that's a very good case. Uh, or even just a space station. The moon. Space station, the moon. Yeah. Any, any place where we go and we want to grow things. I don't want to eat algae all the time. <laughs> if I'm living on Mars, I want some wheat or something. <laughs> well, wheat's windblown. But there'll be, you know... Pumpkins or I don't eat pumpkins. I'm, I'm trying to think of something. <laughs> blueberries. Fries. Blueberries have to be pollinated. I would love fresh blueberries on my yogurt at Mars. <laughs> I don't know what the yogurt's made of, but that's great. <laughs> so just the fact that they actually have uh, like a pretty good idea of how they, they could create robo bees. Yes. Uh, and this actually is produced by a little known company called Walmart. I was going to say, do you know who's <laughs> pushing the patent is Walmart? <laughs> yeah. They get the, they get the patent for robo bees. Crazy. I, I mean, what can you say? Like it's fascinating. And really their only purpose that the robot bees would serve is pollination, right? It's not like they're going in to gather something for their own. Yes. But you could also program them to go and hunt out aphids. Fascinating. Or, yeah, or, you know, go look at things and come back and report. Oh, man. I mean, yeah, you. this is cool. It's like little mini farmers, like AI, like mini little machines. They can do all sorts of things for you. Man, the future. You might even be able to deliver pesticides or fertilizer or, you know, if a, you know, uh, so, you know, your farmer, he plants a whole bunch of things, but he needs to thin them out. Well, let the bees do the thinning. Wow. Just go and put them a little buzzsaw on their little bees. <laughs> <laughs> this could be incredible. 
I guess the, the 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 one thing remaining that was cool on their list was 4D printing. Yeah, uh, just scroll to that. Yeah, it's the idea that you make a 3D object that will change shape over time. So apply an electrical field to it or heat it up or cool it off. This is basically your 3D printing with specific materials that you know the the um the properties of that material so that when you do something to it, it will change in a certain way. So I remember they actually used something like this fictionally in the Batman Begins. Really? Where Bruce Wayne was trying to get some high tech like uh, base jumping suit. Okay. And so he talks to his guy who actually set him up with a material that if you put an electrical current through the cloth, it would remember a shape. So he was putting on a fluid black Batman cape. And then when he would do uh, uh, like a stretch his arms and hands out, the cape would become widespread wings and rigid. Ah. And so it's basically the same concept, but in cloth. And, but but the, for this 4D printing co- stuff, they're talking about way more applications than just cloths. Yeah, that Alfred Pennyworth. I mean, but did Batman even understand who he had in that guy? <laughs> I mean, that, that guy should be winning some Nobel Prize, to tell you what, man. <laughs> oh, yes. He would have. So moving off of that list, there are some other really amazing things that, that's coming down the pike right now. Uh, one of them, finally, fully recyclable wind turbine blades. They're, the company just started developing turbine blades from scratch with the goal that all the parts would be recyclable. Just picture this. These blades are enormous. Enormous. Th- that is incredible just to think about all the material it takes to get something manufactured but to meet a specification like it's 100% recyclable. Yeah. So when we say recyclable, do we mean that they would recycle the material back into another blade or into maybe, other maybe uses? Maybe not. One of the big problems is the resins that are used. Like, you know, fiberglass isn't recyclable usually. Mm. But you use a resin that can be broken down into components again and then pulled out. Or the metals that are used and, and how things are bonded together together. Like your computer is recyclable. It's just that you can't recycle it because of the way it's made. Mm. The parts are glued together. They're melted together. They're soldered. They're, it takes too long to, would take too long to pull apart to get this part and put it in that bin and that part and put it in another bin. There's no reason why anyone would ever want to recycle a computer. Mm. So these people went through the whole process of here's how we build it, but we're building it on purpose so that it can be unbuilt in the future. So we don't need a giant graveyard of these gigantic 100, 120 foot long wind turbine blades buried somewhere out in the Midwest. So just remind me, what becomes of that if you bury it for 200 years? D- does it biodegrade, become something, or is it still going to be sitting there? It'll still be sitting there. Oh. A lot of these things, the resins things, they'll, they'll decompose sometimes into toxic chemicals. Oh. Sometimes into non-toxic chemicals. It depends. You, yeah. you would not be able to use them as a turbine blade anymore because they're going to get weakened and whatever but yeah no they're not really going to go away wow because if they went if it's a type of a substance that could go away they wouldn't use them in a wind turbine blade then we might as well just uh you know shoot these into outer space like in the wally you know create the junk cloud around planet earth yeah yeah sure yeah that doesn't take any energy energy at all yeah (laughs) all right another amazing news story from this week i mean scientifically Coolest thing ever. NASA launches a mission to bullet hit <laughs> an asteroid and move it. So when we watch Star Wars and the Millennium Falcon is pecking off asteroids as it flies by or a Super Star Destroyer shoots them and, and they just like e- evaporate. Yes, of course. Of course. Yeah. No, this is... Um, no, this is... We're going to ramjet crash a... a probe a it's, it's, rocket it, yeah a it satellite like, yeah, it doesn't look like a bullet it looks like a little satellite yeah and as fast as they can get it to go <laughs> and smack it into an asteroid and i thought there's like an, at, at thirteen thousand five hundred miles an hour but it's not going to move it that much no <laughs> even at that speed it's only it's, it's only going to nudge it and that's all they want to <sighs> do they want to demonstrate that they can nudge an asteroid off of its trajectory i mean I, everyone knows it can be done. The physics has been known for hundreds of years, but they've never actually done it. It's a little risky because asteroids aren't necessarily solid. 
what if this is a butterfly effect where you have one bump into another asteroid, which bumps into a thousand other asteroids, oh. and one of them bumps into Jupiter and it explodes? And you know, the movie with Sandra Bullock and George Clooney in space. I don't gravity, know. gravity, oh, yeah, gravity. Yeah, 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 yeah. The movie Gravity. That was the the premise was something exploded in space and the particles and the pieces were shredding all the satellites and it was getting more and more and more and more junk. And there's a name for that. And I know we've talked about it on the show and it's escaping me at the moment because I wasn't thinking along these lines. And my brain's like, I'm not going to remember that for you. <laughs> and so it's a syndrome where you just have rapid disassembly of all these different things and just adds and adds and adds. But I don't think that's going to happen. What they're worried about, I think, is that if the satellite or the, if the meteor, not the meteor. Asteroid? If the asteroid is not in one piece, but it's like, you know, gravel just mutually attracted to each other, when you whack it, it's going to disintegrate. Oh, dear. Even if it was a solid rock, if you hit it hard enough, it's going to disintegrate. So you can't hit it too hard. You can't move it too fast. And you don't want to cause too many small particles to form when you do hit it. And so they're thinking through this issue and they'll get there. And it's going to it's going to move it. And in the future, maybe we can save ourselves from some gigantic meteorite apocalypse. Yeah, the, the, the whole motivation is that they want to save the world from an asteroid collision. Yeah. And, okay, like, I, I get the motivation. I, I don't know how well it'll work, because if it's going to take a while to just prepare your projectile, and then you get it out there to hit the asteroid that's coming for planet Earth, Chances are, by the time you've got your projectile ready, the asteroid's already probably. Yeah, we too would close. have to have it ready to go before we. That makes sense. Yeah. So, I already have projectiles in the in the ready in the launch bay. Yeah. But we had um, I mean, we're tracking basically everything we can find that's dangerous to Earth. There's a lot of little things we don't track, and if they hit the Earth, they just burn up, maybe go pop or something like that. But all the big pieces, we we in the solar system, we know them, we're tracking them. But then you have, was it Omeomea? Oumuamua? I don't remember, that was a couple of years ago, that, that big thing looked like a giant potato chip that flew through the solar system and didn't come back. It's this massive asteroid that was on a hyperbolic trajectory and it came into the solar system and let, what on earth was that? We can't track that. It's never going to return. What about those little rogue things flying around that we don't expect because they're not you know, circulating the sun or orbiting the earth? And they just come from out of space and smacks upside the head and... Man. Yeah, you can't protect against that one. Wow. Makes you even kind of want to protect the other important bodies of the solar system. Like, you, you, it, you, we would hate to see a moon around Saturn. Or just, Saturn loses rings. Yeah. That'd be just, terrible. Man. Interesting uh, damages it could cause. So for another story, we have a new world record for the lowest temperature... 38 pico kelvins. Rob, <laughs> that's bitter cold for you. And in order to do this, you have to like go through a lot of trouble with the instruments to measure the temperature drop in about two seconds by dropping something from a great height. And then <laughs> the temperature's and already warmed up, I guess. There's the strangest... Str I, I never would have thought... I figured out if you want to make something cool, you take an ice box and put it in the refrigerator and then inside the ice box there's another refrigerator and there but no they use a gas expanding in a tower yeah and as a gas expands it gets colder what and it goes all down to almost absolute zero just from the expansion of a gas and then they laser cool the molecules at the very end to stop them from wiggling that's that's kind of cool but pico let's see he goes deci was a tenth Centies a hundredth, millis a thousandth, micros a millionth, nanos a billionth, pico is a trillionth. A trillionth, just a few trillionths of a degree above absolute zero. That's how they're able to cool something up to that level. That's almost nothing. Because absolute zero, you don't have no matter. You suck all the energy out, you, there's no matter because it equals MC squared. But that is really cool. And it's just from expanding gas, that's all. Just expand the gas in the tower and... That means if you were in that tower and you were falling with that expanding gas, you would freeze. Oh, man. <laughs> well, that's that's kinda, lightning fast. That's, that's cool to think about. Yeah. It's like being in outer space without the sun. Because you see, the sun, of course, is a giant heat source. Outer space is not cold. But if you could be like in the shadow 
like on on the there's no dark side of the moon. Um, trying to think of a, of a of a of a body in a solar system that doesn't that's locked onto the Mercury rotates, Venus rotates, Earth and Moon rotate, Mars rotates, Jupiter rotates, Saturn and Uranus rotate. Okay, there's something somewhere in the solar system that's gravitationally locked, so that one side's <laughs> always pointing away from the sun to be there, and you'd be freezing, freezing, freezing cold. Ooh, wow, that is pretty crazy. Now, now what do you do with this knowledge? Are you going to make things super cold for new uh, scientific innovations? The, in the article, they did point out that different materials at insanely yeah. cold temperatures change what they what they do what they're like even yeah, their state of the, being their properties go get really weird like you can't tell the difference between the liquid and the solid phase anymore and things like that that is and, so strange and then you get things like superconductivity that happen at, at very cold temperatures when electrons will go through a wire with zero electrical resistance and if we could figure out how to do that at 80 degrees on a nice warm summer day i mean we would save gazillions of dollars in electrical transmission costs Wow. But we're not quite there yet, so we just keep mm. exploring and, you know, okay, now they can get to that temperature, now let's do something else at this temperature. Let's do something else at this temperature. Oh, wait a minute, this just happened? What on earth is that? And then they can build some new scientific discovery on that, maybe some Nobel Prizes in the future. Just, I don't know, I, I don't know what there is to learn anymore down there. Mm -hmm. But there are still things to learn, apparently. Well, thank you everybody for joining us on this quest. If you would be awesome enough as to share Equinox with someone else that yes, can please. benefit from it, you never know who needs to hear this show, but you probably know someone who does. Now, we write the links in the show notes for each episode, so if you want to refer to something that Rob and I mentioned, and then you can also get more of our content if you join Equinox Plus membership through the Patreon. A link to that membership page is available in the show notes. You can check out Biblical Genetics, Rob's other project on YouTube for his latest videos. And he also shares it on Facebook and uh, anywhere else, Rob? Facebook and uh, YouTube. You know, I'm on Gab and I'm on Parler. And, and biblicalgenetics.com. And biblicalgenetics.com, yes, yes, yes. Good, good. And if you want to find me, I'm at JCS Darnell on Twitter. Until next time, goodbye, Rob. And tune in for Joe and I busting our gut. <laughs> as it's gonna be hard to keep a straight face as we go through the Ig Nobel Prizes, one of my favorite things to discuss ever. You've been listening to Equinox.